So it felt fitting to spend a moment to acknowledge the past as we celebrate pride. And by that, in, in, and in that way, I would like to um, give tribute to a dear friend of mine whose story may resonate with some of you. His name is Michael, and I first met him in 2002 on Fire Island. His house was very close to the ferry stop, and it was always fun to sit on his deck and watch people come and go as the ferry came in. Um, and I spent many, many happy summers with him. And the reason that he became so dear to me, apart from his generosity and hospitality and, and the, the great dinner parties that we had there, is that I recognized in him an elder. And it was very humbling because I realized how important it was that even in my own reference and in my own growth, it had really only been about my experience. And sometimes it's difficult to uh, remember that there were those who went before that made the now possible. So Michael was extraordinary because Michael happened to be sitting in Stonewall on the day that, uh, as the urban legend would have it, the transvestite threw her shoe at the cop who was trying to arrest people in the bar and do what they very often did and bundle them into the back of the police vans just by because they were there assembled together as gay men. And of course, therefore, he didn't realize at the time, but he was perched right on the edge of history being made. And he would sit with me and talk to me about what that was like in that moment, what that week was like, and then what the subsequent years and decades were like as a gay man living in New York. Now, if any of you were um, in the lower part of the, the West Village in those years, you may even remember his restaurant, um, The Black Sheep. He uh, was very proud that he had a special table assigned and even Leonard Bernstein would come and sit at that table and uh, eat. He was a fantastic chef. And as I said, I'm very fond of him because he reminded me of how much people had gone through to make my and our freedoms possible. I also worked with a lady, her name uh, is Rosemary. She lived in Greenwich Village um, for many, many, many years of her life. She used to tell a lovely story about why she loved the village so much. And she said it was encapsulated by one moment when she said her daughter was in the pushchair and uh, someone walked by in full drag regalia. And the little girl pointed and said, look, mummy, an angel. And she said, this is why I'm in... Uh, Greenwich Village because I would love for my daughter to be able to see the beauty in that and to accept the beauty for what it was. She also talked about what it was like to live in uh, the village during the 80s, during the, uh, the gay plague um, that was sweeping the nation. And I say plague only because um, it was... Um, as we know, vilified by the press and by the government and people were dying. And I remember Rosemary used to say she would greet someone on the stairs of her apartment building and say to somebody, oh, I haven't seen so-and-so from apartment 6B for a while. Um, oh, they died. Her hairdresser, the persons uh, on the, uh, on, in the store at the bottom of her road, they were dying like this. And I'm sure most of you remember these times very well. So with Michael and Rosemary and the village being examples of what um, so many went through uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s and early 90s, I wanted to light this candle. And um, in fact, Terry gave it to me uh, when she came to visit. And so Terry, I want you to know that I've been waiting for the right moment to light it. And it felt like today was it. Made by a queer candle company. 
and it came all the way from the States. And here I am in Cape Town about to light it. And I would like to honor all those who I've just mentioned, all those who suffered um, and fought and demonstrated and were activists for the freedoms, quote unquote, that we treasure today. And to say to them all, thank you. now to share with you one of my favorite poems written by Hafiz, who is often considered a contemporary of Rumi from the 14th century. And I think his poem says it all. So I want to share it with you before I introduce you to my dear friend. It's called, It Happens All the Time in Heaven. It happens all the time in heaven. And someday it will begin to happen again on earth. That men and women who are married and men and men who are lovers and women and women who give each other light often get down on their knees and while so tenderly holding their lover's hand with tears in their eyes, will sincerely speak, saying, my dear, how can I be more loving to you? How can I be more kind? In a moment, I'm going to introduce you to my friend and contemporary here in Cape Town. And it was his request uh, that we play this next song. I, I don't, I think it doesn't even need introduction. Um, its title, of course, is True Colors. And Hans will go on to explain why he, she, they chose it. Um, but I do want to say that I'm very, very, very fond of Hans, uh, who has been like um, a brother, sister, and unicorn for me here in Cape Town, um, helping me to run the youth group and the youth program that we have, but also just being a great support and um, source of laughter and honesty and um, comfort and reassurance and fellow support. Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, I just want to do this. Happy Pride. Happy Pride Univers Unitarian Universalist community of Palisades with love beaming from Cape Town to your hearts. Um, I am, Pepper mentioned the the theme for this building a rainbow bridge. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of that rainbow journey with you. And as we all know, rainbows are associated with unicorns. So I brought my best friend here, my lucky mascot. This is Donatella Versace. So we just want to wish you all a very happy pride. Um, thank and um, thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this experience, to share the Sacred Sunday with you. Pippa, thank you so much for your very kind words and for extending a seat at, our, as, as, at, at the family table with your community. I'm just going to take a moment and to just show you, there's our chalice symbol, as you can see in the background there. Um, so, Thank you so much for just the opportunity to be in togetherness with you. Um, 
The reason why I chose that song, there are so many. Um, Cindy Lauper is just one of my all time favorite artists. She's just got a powerhouse of a voice. She's the ultimate uh, expressionist artist to me. Um, she is an icon. She's become a, an advocate for within the, uh, the queer community. Uh, she was a staunch ally when the Me Too movement came out. Um, and what, what particularly, uh, a particular reason why I'm very fond of her is I've just only have recently learned that she's a very staunch advocate and ally for the, the homeless queer community, the youth, uh, the homeless queer youth. Um, so that, and that to me resonates quite deeply in my heart, especially when youngsters who are struggling to find themselves, find their place in the world, struggling with identity, who don't necessarily have the support um, that she can, that she's one of those few people that stands up and, uh, and fights for their rights and fights for representation and strives to find the dignity, love, and acceptance that they are due. Um, an interesting question, um, as I was researching a little bit of, of, of Cindy, uh, I watched an interesting clip where she was sharing that as she was coming up as a, as a budding new artist, uh, the music executives uh, from the industry were trying to package her at the time as the next Barbara Streisand. And according to her words, she, she says, I don't want to be Barbara Streisand. I don't want to be a second rate somebody. I want to be a first rate me. And I just thought when I watched that clip, there was something that just, there was a moment that washed over me and I just thought how powerful that this person um, really knows themselves, that they know how to, to speak with such authenticity and such uh, gusto and gumption, you know, that no, I'm not this other person. I'm not striving to be that, I'm my own person. And I, that just made me more enamored with her. Um, it touches on, and that touches sort of on another quote by Oscar Wilde, who's a very, you know, as we know, is a, queer literary um, persona. And he was, he's, he's quoted as saying, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And how true. Um, you know, in the sharing, you know, just speaking from Cindy's experience of the music industry, trying to force her, box her in or try to contain her and, and you know, to project her in a certain way. So much of the world I find sometimes is trying to make us be a certain way or to fit someone else's agenda, um, which essentially diminishes us. It diminishes that who we are, you know, and our gifts. Um, so there's a beautiful quote that I found that sort of, that speaks to being yourself. Um, it's, it starts, it's by Marianne Williamson. And it's from the sources, A Return to Love. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. And in this, I'm just going to say, feel free to substitute. We are Unitarians. Feel free to place a placeholder there, whether it's creator, spirit, source, Allah. Who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. 
we were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. That's such a powerful statement. I just feel one could take a moment and really just let that sink in. Um, so um, I am on a little bit of a timeline. So let me just, um, John, Pepe, feel free to interrupt if I'm going over, but I'll try and be brief. Um, part of my journey as a gay man, um, I struggled with my own place in the world. I struggled with my own sense of, ident of identity. Um, it was painful. Um, the more I sought a acceptance externally from authority figures like my parents, from you know, teachers, from later on from colleagues or my employers, the more I strove to, to, to seek acceptance from them, the more it was withheld for me. And, and ironically, in the same vein, the more I, I that very same acceptance, self-acceptance is what I also kept for myself. So it was a period of self-loathing, not accepting myself, um, wanting to just be normal like other people, um, diminishing uh, my true colors, who I was. So there were two pivotal moments that changed that. One was um, I was depressed at the time. I went for counseling with an organization, the Triangle Project. And thanks to them, I met with a counselor. And in my sharing that I was just feeling so dejected that I know I felt unworthy, I felt unloved, I felt I was not accepted. Um, this counselor sort of changed, changed the tables on me and he posed the picture and he said, well, what if, what if you could be your own best parent? What if you, that unconditional love, that, that sense of dignity and acceptance, what if you could gift that to yourself? And I, in that moment, I thought, what, really? I can do that? Um, and that was a game changer for me. It really changed the tra trajectory of my life where it, where really, it gave me a sense of self-empowerment, like, well, I can, and why not try it out? And the second part of that, uh, sort of the second beat of this journey of sort of, of self-realization is I was part of a community yoga practice where we met once a week. And over the course of two years, um, you know, through you do the, the physical, the asanas, the postures, and it all ends with meditation. And meditation is one of the key things that has been part of my journey. And in that moment of meditation, when you just let go and surrender, um, in, that, in that pose of rest and just were allowing peace to wash over you, I would release tears. And initially they were tears of pain and hurt and um, fear. And over the, the course of the two years, I found that those tears started changing, the nature of them changed, that they became one of loss and deficit and lack. And they turned into tears of contentment of spontaneous joy and mostly of gratitude. Thank you that I'm alive. Thank you that I have all this agency to be myself in so many different ways in life. So it was an amazing journey of just finding the rainbow within me, finding, finding the true colors that make me me and learning to not be a second rate somebody to please others, but really learning to be a first rate me. So with that, I just say, thank you for allowing me this sharing. And um, 
happy pride. And you know what? What I love about rainbows is it's a spectrum. We all fall on the spectrum. And can you imagine if rainbows had a missing color? It wouldn't be a rainbow. So may we all find the rainbow within our hearts. Thank you. I don't know if you can see all that fluttering of hands, hands. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I realize that in my excitement and nervousness that I'm feeling today for some reason, um, I put things out of order a little bit and I read the Hafiz poem too early, but I just want to pick up the closing lines because I feel that they are a beautiful segue into what Terry wants to bring to share today. And of course, Terry needs no introduction to our group because she's so beloved and so important within our community. So Terry, before I hand over, I want to go back to Hafiz and just finish with this line, which is universal. It's not about queer. It's not about anything external. It's about everything internal. It's about our quest of how we can show up in this life. And these are the questions. My dear, how can I be more loving to you? And how can I be more kind? And on that note, Terry, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Hans, that was amazing. Thank you. And Pippa, I have my queer candle lit this morning as well. So I... Um, here goes. I'm also nervous. Um, as many of you know, I have been a queer educator for more than 35 years. And over that time, our language about diversity has changed a great deal. For much of my early career, in, I worked in un, underfunded communities in schools populated almost entirely by students of color. In those days, teaching tolerance was considered groundbreaking. Later, that language shifted to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in the past eight years or so, sometimes belonging has been thrown into the mix. And I want to take a moment to pause here because the shifts between tolerance to inclusion to belonging is pretty seismic. Those of us with marginalized identity moved from being targeted to being tolerated. But that's tolerated doesn't feel great. And so then it was like, okay, well, you can you can you can come along, you can be included. And again, better, but not great. And so now this movement for belonging is also better, but none of it feels like enough to me. And unfortunately today, there are many places and spaces where LGBTQ plus members are being targeted again. So as I look out at the world, the people that I admire are people that have identities that others consider other. They're queer folks, women, people of color, people who grew up in working class families. My favorite peeps are the ones who live at the intersections of multiple of these marginalized identities. And why do I admire them? They're creative, imaginative, fun, and have tremendous problem-solving abilities. They each have a wicked sense of humor. They are wise, inclusive, and show tremendous compassion for all living things. Do not get me started on lesbians with their four-legged friends. You should see Pippa. And I know you, Arlene, right? So we, we know, they love all things. So last year, I started to think about that living with a marginalized, marginalized identities is actually a superpower. 
We have unique gifts to offer the world that are desperately needed right now. So I want us to move that needle beyond tolerance, inclusion, belonging, to being celebrated. Jazz hands all around. <laughs> it makes sense to me that the struggles and obstacles that we have faced have made us view the world differently. Queer people have had to imagine ourselves into being. We've had to navigate so many tricky situations. I am a grand master at seeking solutions because I had to be. As we celebrate our queer identity on this Pride Sunday, and we think about our future, I would like to invite you to consider one particular superpower, and that is of allyship. We are called to be allies. Work for equity is all of our work. I just read a reflection this morning from a dear friend who's a Catholic nun, Chris Kohlhofer. She writes about how interconnected we all are with all living things. She wrote, whatever we do to one another, we are doing to the human family, to the earth community, and to the universe. For too long, many people have stayed on the sidelines of the struggle for the equity of for the other. The thinking it was their problem and therefore they had to fix it. The notion is nonsense. Asking people who are being oppressed with all of the disadvantages that that entails to fix systemic oppression is ridiculous. In the words of Hanan Ashraru, a Palestinian politician, activist, and scholar, we cannot rely upon the silenced to tell us they are suffering. A few years ago, I attended a workshop on white allyship facilitated by a woman of color named Whitney Parnell. She was fire. Ms. Parnell spoke about how each of us has aspects of our identities that are privileged. And she challenged those of us in attendance to use those places of privilege to advocate for others. So using myself as an example, I, Christian raised, must speak in support of those facing religious persecution. I, as a white woman, must seek justice for people of color. I, as a cisgendered woman, must be an ally for the gender expansive community. I, as a highly educated person, must advocate for equity in education. In these very divisive times, we can do good work by showing up for each other with kindness, compassion and activism. We can listen carefully and without judgment. We can be deeply curious about other people's experiences. We can point out those instances where people's voices and opinions are being overlooked. We can speak up when we know things are wrong. We can do better. I'd say we must do better. I would like to conclude with a quote from William Sloan Coffin. May God, and as Hans said, spirit, universe, whatever language works for you. May God give you the grace to never sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Thank you.
And on that note, I want to hand over to my beloved Essie or Sharon, who will introduce herself uh, as we close and we walk back. Well, let's let's dance. Let's dance the light fantastic across the bridge and come back to Africa. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So as introduced, I'm Sharon or Essie, Sharon Farr. Um, I've been a documentary filmmaker in South Africa for more than 30 years. Um, and I don't ordinarily lead with this, but I'm also a gay woman <laughs> and have been very lucky to have been free in my living as that um, since 1994. Um, to the extent that I have married a woman, I have been the other mother to three children um, who we had with an anonymous donor. So I have lived an extraordinarily free life um, since the moment I allowed myself to come out in the mid nineties as well. Um, and so, you know, we live in, in a country that's known to have the best constitution in the world, one that protects all people. And yet in South Africa with that amazing constitution that has afforded me freedoms, Queer people are still murdered and persecuted regularly on in many areas of the country. There are a lot of organizations here that do amazing work to support South Africans across the queer spectrum. Hans mentioned the Triangle Project. There are, there are quite a few. Um, and these organizations also support the thousands and thousands of Africans from all over the continent who have fled the most unbelievable persecution in their home countries, um, with their lives being threatened, et cetera. I'm gonna share another sort of personal moment. Um, I was working on a documentary shoot in Nigeria a few years ago, and I was in the minivan with my client for this corporate documentary. And for some reason out of the blue, she said, ugh, homosexuality is disgusting. I find it disgusting. So I said, oh, I said, okay. <laughs> and then I said to her, so what is, what is the punishment for being gay in Nigeria? And she said with absolute pride, 15 years in jail. So I thought, okay, this is not the time to get hardcore. <laughs> so I said to her, okay. I said, so 15 years in jail for being gay. I said, so do you think people then choose to be gay? I mean, would you choose to be gay if you were going to get 15 years in jail? And then she sort of, her brain started ticking. And I said to her, so, so that makes me think that people don't choose to be queer. They are queer. They are gay. And I think it shifted her perspective so much. Um, yeah, Ooh, this continent, there are so few countries in this continent, even Namibia right next door to us, um, are busy looking at, at, um, making more draconian laws and punishments for queer people. Um, Ghana has just implemented some new legislation as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to be done and South Africa is, is a free place, you know, for a lot of those, those people that come from Africa. Um, anyway, let me not waffle on about that. I can see time is, is marching, but so the person that I'm introducing today, um, is Belinda Kalkamba Kafasi, who is a drag queen and an activist really working at the coalface of these issues. Uh, she works for an incredible organization called Gender Dynamics that supports and lobbies for the rights of transgender people. She started an organization called Black Drag Magic that challenges the misconception that it's un-African to be queer. And I had the privilege of filming Belinda performing Brenda Fussy's classic song about Mandela called My Black President at Cape Town Pride this year. Um, and also interviewed her at her home in Kailicha, which is one of the largest townships in Cape Town and one of the places that 
queer black people get persecuted, get murdered regularly. We filmed her walking through the streets in this glamorous flamboyant outfit. And I've been so impressed by her bravery, her determination, her vision. Happy Sunday, everybody. Happy Pride. And let us dance our way into the end of this month and this weekend, celebrating who we are, what we strive for, and the love and bond that we share week in and week out. Thank you, everybody. And to everything that has been said and unsaid, all of the yearnings of our hearts, our hopes, our fears, our prayers, I say yes and amen, and let it be so, let it be so. Thank you, everybody. If you like this video, please like us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and click on the bell to be notified whenever we post a new video. Thank you.